This week on Q&A, journalist and author Ahmed Rashid on the 10th anniversary publication of his book, Taliban. Ahmed Rashid, author of Taliban and other books about Pakistan and Afghanistan. What would you sum up as what you see the situation today? Very complicated, very complex. Um, huge dangers involved because of the resurgence of the Taliban, the fact that the Taliban have now become a regional model. We have Taliban in Pakistan, in Central Asia, uh, the continued presence of Al-Qaeda, um, the big fear about, you know, that they could do another major attack in Europe or the United States. Uh, and now we are entering a kind of end game with the, with the U.S. possibly withdrawing, NATO certainly withdrawing. Um, and what are you going to leave behind? And that's what is kind of grappling me uh, in my work, that, you know, I don't want to see another bout of chaos uh, following an American withdrawal or such a shaky f uh, series of, um, um, you know, political arrangements that they fall apart the moment the Americans leave. Um, it's going to be very complex to get this region stable um, without a U.S. military presence there. How would you... Uh, if if you saw a member of the Taliban walking down the street of Kabul or one of the villages, is there any way to recognize them? Well, I, yes. I mean, you know, they have a they have their their trademark black turban. Uh, a lot of them tend to wear black clothes, um, but they you know they do stand out. They have they have a certain mannerism, which perhaps would be difficult for an American to recognize. But compared to the normal Pashtun you know villages, Pashtun being the ethnic group from from which they come from. I mean, there's a mannerism. I, I wouldn't be able to put my, sort of des describe it to you, but I would be able to, um, you know, for example, I mean, when I go to, in, in Pakistan, when you go to Quetta or Peshawar, these are border cities on the border with Afghanistan. A lot of Afghan Taliban and Pakistani Taliban are there. When you're walking down in the street, you can certainly see who are Taliban and who are not. If you go to Afghanistan now and we're walking around, are they among the people now? Not uh, in the major cities and not in the major areas where, you know, NATO American troops are. They, they appear there at night a lot. But in the rural areas, yes, I mean, there are a lot of Taliban and, the, and, and a lot of people won't, wouldn't venture out. I mean, even Kabul, I mean, 10 miles outside Kabul, you've got Taliban. Um, and journalists, for example, uh, you know, civilians, NGOs, aid workers, uh, they wouldn't venture out there. The same goes for Kandahar. The, the second largest city, uh, which is to be the target of a major U.S. offensive in the months to come. Um, right outside the city, they're Taliban, uh, and, and very visible in the villages, uh, not frightened at all, not hiding during the day, um, quite visible. This book, uh, Taliban, I've got my hand. Uh, when did, I know in the introduction, and you've got an introduction and then a second introduction. When did you start writing this book? I started it in, uh, in uh, 1999. Uh, uh, it was published in 2000. Um, and at that time, I couldn't find a publisher to publish it. Um, several publishers agreed and then let me down. And I finally found a publisher who stripped many of my rights because he was kind of doing me a favor. And um, this was a publisher in, 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 in London. And um, uh, anyway, I was very grateful to him that he published it. And he then sold it to Yale University Press where, so that it could be published in the U.S. And I was very surprised, you know, because I'd had such a bum time trying to sell this book. Um, and actually in America, uh, it really took off in hardback. I, I remember it sold about 20 or 30,000 copies. This is before 9-11. And um, because people here were suddenly waking up to the fact, the Clinton administration, because you'd had al-Qaeda hits, you know, on the embassies in Africa, you'd had the, uh, the hit on the U.S. warship, coal, and people were waking up in Washington and, you know, in the sort of a analysis, the military, to possibly, you know, what is this Taliban? So um, it, it, it's, it did well, and the week of 9-11, it had come, just come out in paperback here, and uh, then it kind of took off from there. Where were you on 9-11 when it happened? I was at home in Lahore, Pakistan, watching it. And uh, the moment, uh, you know, I, I called my wife in and I said, this is Al-Qaeda and uh, the Americans are going to invade Afghanistan. And, um, you, know, and, you know, very soon after that, I was asked to come to Washington uh, to meet with people here. 
um, uh, you know, bef as they were trying to prepare, uh, uh, you know, for the war and what to do. Um, a lot of people wrote to me asking me, a lot of Europeans, governments, all sorts of people wrote to me. Nobody had a clue what the Taliban were and, and what this all meant, you know. Well, you know, I mean, when you get into the book, it's so complicated. I mean, this whole business, there are a lot of simple questions I want to yeah. ask you. Can you be a member of al-Qaeda and a member of the Taliban? Well, um, you can, but 99.9% uh, uh, .9 of the Taliban are not members of al-Qaeda. Um, you've got Pakistani groups, militant groups. You've got Central Asian militant groups and other militant groups from the Middle East, from North Africa, who have their own militant groups and are members of al-Qaeda. But, you know, the Afghan Taliban, I mean, you know, they never took part in 9-11. Um, uh, the majority of them probably didn't even know that Osama was planning 9-11. Um, they haven't taken part in any kind of international terrorism since then. Yes, they've killed American soldiers in large numbers in Afghanistan, but they haven't taken part in any of these kinds of bombings, you know, the London bombings, the Spain bombings, uh, etc. Um, other groups have, but the Taliban have, have remained very Afghan. Um, and as they see it now, I mean, you know, as, as they have said, this is a jihad against foreign occupation. So we're not talking about a global jihad or attacking Americans everywhere. We're only talking about, you know, getting rid of what, what, what they call the foreign occupation. When was the first time there was such a person that was a member of the Taliban? And what's the right way to pronounce it? Uh, Taliban is the right way to pronounce it. Well, you know, one of the Taliban allies, for example, is called um, Jalaluddin Haqqani, the Haqqani Network. Um, he operates from Pakistan in eastern Afghanistan. Um, He's an ally of the Taliban, rather, but he's very extreme. He's very close to al-Qaeda. Now, again, um, he's carried out, I think, his people have carried out a lot of, um, helped al-Qaeda carried out attacks. He's benefited from al-Qaeda training and uh, probably al-Qaeda money and al-Qaeda direction. Um, but exactly, you know, when, I mean, I wouldn't still call him al-Qaeda. I would still call him uh, an Afghan extremist group with close links to the Taliban but possibly even closer links to al-Qaeda. I still wouldn't call him necessarily al-Qaeda. But there are several groups in Pakistan who, who are linked to al-Qaeda who I would call al-Qaeda. This book, why did you write it in the first place? What was driving you to get this information out? Well, you know, I, I, I was, I've been covering Afghanistan for 30 years, and there were, many, uh, there were many stepping stones in the middle when people around me told me, you must write a book now, you know, this period is finished, you know. For example, when the Soviets uh, left, people said, write a book about the Soviet occupation, you know. Uh, when the Geneva Accords were done, when, um, you know, uh, when the communist regime in Kabul fell in 92, um, I mean, I, you know, there were many instances when I really should have written a book, and I kept deferring it and deferring it. And finally, you know, um, I was about, you know, one of just a few journalists who was following the Taliban as they merged in 93, 94, and then, you know, as they conquered the whole of Afghanistan, Bin Laden came in. And then I really, when I would go, I really felt the, uh, the, the lack of knowledge anywhere about who these people were. And um, I felt, you know, now I have to write a book. And so really this book is not just about the Taliban. It's a kind of, you know, it's a, squeezing together all my 30 years of knowledge and experience about Afghanistan. Uh, but writing about the specific period of the Taliban, when they, how they emerged, and, and what happened um, after that. So, you know, a lot had to do with my mother, my, my family were urging me, my wife was urging me to write a book, write a book, when are you going to write a book? You know, stop all this daily journalism and 800 word pieces, write a book, you know. So finally I realized that, you know, I think the impetus was the fact that everywhere I went people just didn't know what was going on. And I was very, you know, I'm an activist. I mean, I was trying to wake up people that, look, there's a really major threat here. And if you read the end of the, I mean, nothing has been changed in the book from when I wrote it in 99. And I'm trying to say to the American Western public, you know, wake up. This is a huge threat. You know, the, this uh, Al Qaeda is there. Um, the, the Taliban are hosting them. And or, you're all ignoring them. And um, let me go through the basics with you about your your own life. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Pakistan. Where? In, in Rawalpindi at that time, which was which is near the capital Islamabad. And what was your family like? Well, uh, uh, my father was an engineer 
uh, and for many years uh, he had uh, 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 he had we'd settled in England after the war. He was in the in the army in the in the British Indian Army at that time, fighting the Japanese, and uh, he was one of the first Indian Indian graduates of uh, engineering university in England, and. Um, so uh, for some years we settled in England, and uh, then we moved back to Pakistan. And uh, he moved back to Pakistan in the 60s. So I got my education as a cross between partly in England, partly in Pakistan, um, I, and eventually I went to university in uh, in England. Um, Where did you go? I went to Cambridge. Um, what did you study? I studied. Uh, I started actually studying English literature. I fancied myself as a writer at that time. A writer of fiction. I used to write short stories. I used to write a lot of poetry. Um, but then it was, you know, I was at, you know, I was there in '68, uh, and it was, you know, the whole radical movement and anti-Vietnam. And of course, in uh, by '70 in Pakistan, we'd had this very traumatic experience about Bangladesh, or what was then East Pakistan, um, at the war in East Pakistan, which eventually became Bangladesh. Um, huge atro atrocities committed. Uh, and, and the division of the country, which for a person, you know, my generation was, was the, perhaps the most traumatic thing that happened in our lives. I mean, that our country was just, you know, split in two. Um, and and um, so that led to, uh, you know, a fair amount of, uh, you know, radicalization at university as, as everyone was in those days. I looked up the numbers today, but if you look at India sitting there with 1.2 billion people, you have Pakistan on one side with about 170 million. Yeah. Correct me on any of this. Yeah. On the other side, Bangladesh with about 162 million. Yeah. And then above it, right above Pakistan, Afghanistan yeah. Yeah. with about 28 million people. Right. What's, when did the British influence? I know Briti Britain got out of Afghanistan, what, 1919 or something like that. Yeah. When did the British influence come into that part of that world? In, well, in, in India proper, it came in the, in, uh, as early as the uh, 16th century fifth, and, and early 17th century, where they set up trading stations and all the rest of it. Uh, and then the trading company, the East India Company, um, uh, ruled parts of India, especially along the coast, and then slowly conquered the whole of India. And it was only after the Indian Mutiny, what is called the Indian Mutiny and what, what Indians and Pakistanis call the uh, Indian War of Independence, that actually the crown, Queen Victoria at that time, took over the whole um, subcontinent as part of the British Empire. And then India was ruled by uh, the, the British uh, government rather than by the East India Company. And of course, that lasted till 47, 1947, when partition took place. Uh, and that was the creation of Pakistan in two halves, one on you know, uh, one side of India, the other on the other side of India. Uh, and the British left. And, um, uh, we've been an independent state since then. Was Pakistan called Pakistan when it was under that whole umbrella? No, no, it was it was British India. It was it was India. So you were actually born in British India? No, no. Uh, partition took place. Sorry, in forty-seven, and I was born, born in forty-eight. Yeah, I was yeah. born one year later. Yeah. So you were educated in Cambridge, and did you? When did you start thinking about being a journalist? Well, you know, I, it was part of this whole thing of becoming, wanting to become a writer. I thought at one point, you know, I would do a PhD on tribal society. I became very interested in tribes and tribal society. Um, and, and by uh, fortuitous chance, I was in, um, uh, I was in uh, Afghanistan in 78 when the communist coup, coup took place and overthrew uh, the, the uh, Republican government. Um, and I was then in Afghanistan again. Um, it, when, the, when the Soviets invaded. I was in Kandahar, in fact, when the Soviets invaded. And after that, I came to London, and um, I was at a loose end. I, you know, I hadn't done any uh, serious work. I'd been, my father had moved back. I was working with my father and his company. Um, and I came to London, and um, uh, the Soviets were being very difficult about giving visas to journalists to go to Kabul. And I said, oh, I've just come from Kabul. And uh, I had a friend who'd taken some very good pictures there, a photographer. And he said, let's go and try and sell these pictures to one of the newspapers in England. And we went to The Guardian, I remember. And, I, um, and the Guardian foreign editor said he loved the pictures. He said, I want a story to go with these pictures. What's happening in Kabul? So, the, so my friend said, you know, you write the story. So um, I wrote a story for The Guardian and in his pictures. And, and after that, it just kind of snowballed because people said, you know, 
I, I knew what was going on. I knew a lot of the figures who had come into power then through, through the Soviets. Um, and then I just started, uh, you know, going back uh, to Afghanistan. I moved back to Pakistan in, in 82. Um, and I, I, you know, perhaps my, uh, what was fortunate was that um, uh, I was perhaps one of the only international journalists based in Pakistan who was able to go to both Kabul and, and see the whole Soviet setup and report on it, as well as go to Peshawar and see the Mujahideen and go into Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. Because in those days, the Soviets used to say that, especially to the Americans and to the British, that if you go and report on the Mujahideen um, who are fighting us, we will not give you a visa to come to Kabul. So you didn't have people who were able to see both sides. Let so me ask you about Mujahideen. Who are they? Who were they? Well, the Mujahideen were the Afghan patriots who fled Afghanistan after the communist coup, and, but, but particularly after the Soviet invasion, and uh, came, became refugees in Pakistan and, uh, or in Iran and in other places. Five million came into Pakistan. And if you think of the Afghan population at that time of being about 20 million or 18 or 20 million, it's almost a quarter of the population fled. Um, and they came into Pakistan. And then, of course, they were aided and abetted by First Pakistan to, to, to launch um, attacks against the Soviet occupation. And then, of course, um, the Americans got into it. The CIA got into it. The Saudis, the international help came to them. And then they became this guerrilla force. The name came from where? Mujahideen. Well, uh, 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 the name, the, the, it's an Islamic uh, uh, term, which means that you're fighting for the faith, basically. And so the, the struggle in Afghanistan at that time was portrayed as a jihad against foreign occupation, much like what the Taliban are saying today. Uh, except that jihad was, of course, supported by the Americans, because this was a jihad at the height of the Cold War. And, and here were these Afghans actually killing Soviet soldiers. And, and I mean, it, you know, many people have pointed out that actually this war was the closest. You know, you had the CIA just across the border in Pakistan. You had American soldiers, you know, uh, uh, Russian soldiers a few miles across the border. This was the closest that the Americans and the Soviets actually got to fighting, literally fighting. Are you aligned now with any particular leader in Pakistan? No, not at all. I'm very much a journalist and reporting on what's happening, and um, not at all. I, I haven't taken part in any kind of politics at all. This book, go back to 9-11, and I assume, I, I read in the, in the introduction that you sold over a million and a half copies of this book. Probably more than that by now. Well, um, certainly more than that, because it, uh, a million and a half was in America after 9-11. After um, but it came out in 26 languages. So I have no, I have no um, account of how much it sold and how many Still languages. Still published by Yale. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I mean, it's been very pleasing. It's, it's been in print for 10 years, which is very rare for a, a sort of academic, you know, political book like this. Um, one reason is, of course, because Afghanistan has been in the news and it's been a demand. But, but I think, you know, two areas for, for which I am very grateful for as an author. One is students. It's been, it's still on university courses. It's still a textbook for any, any courses on terrorism, Islam, South Asia, Afghanistan. If you do any of these courses, um, it's still a book. I mean, it's still a book to be read. And secondly, um, anybody who goes out to Afghanistan, for example, the U.S. military, it's, it's you know, I was, I was very, I've been very touched. Uh, some of your most famous regiments, uh, the 82nd Airborne and the 10th Mountain Division, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm told that, you know, they, by their officers and all who send me emails that the book is put into the, the rucksack at the top of every soldier who goes out for the first time to Afghanistan, you know, for sort of familiarization. Can, and and can, that has been, you know, kept it going. Can you remember after 9-11, was there somebody in this country that held this book up and said, you got to read this? Yeah, I think uh, at that time, you know, um, uh, certainly, I mean, well, I, I, I remember the, my publishers telling me that uh, literally 24 hours after there was, after 9-11, uh, I think uh, President Bush was still out in the, you know, out, out of Washington. And they said that 300 copies for 300 books had come, orders for 300 books had come from the White House. Did you ever find out who, who was responsible? No, I, I, I have no idea. But I presume that, you know, I mean, the hardback, as I said, had been circulated and people in the know had, people interested in this region had read it, people interested in who were doing terrorism had read it. 
So I can presume there must have been someone who must have alerted everyone that they better read this book. Did somebody else then in this country hold it up or put you on television or start the whole process that led to a million and a half copies plus being Well, sold? I think, you know, it, it came in the news then that, you know, it, I mean, it came, it was reported quite widely that everybody in the White House was reading this book. Tony Blair in Britain actually publicly said that, you know, we're all reading this book um, in, in, in Downing Street. And... Um, so I mean that was sort of you know, a bit of a publicity thing, and 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 it it you know it was read by 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 you know prime ministers and presidents and their staff I mean all around Europe, and um, there was huge kind of you know everyone wanted me to come and visit them and all the rest of it, um, but um, but here I think you know it became known certainly you know in the sort of East Coast belt here of the the policy wonks if you like you know. It became known that everyone, you know, in in government was reading this book. The military began to read the book. Um, so, uh, and as I said, I think you know this. You know, here was a, a, a an incident in which literally, you know, ninety percent of Americans had absolutely no idea about Afghanistan. They had no idea who the Taliban were, um, uh, and they know had very little idea even of Islamic fundamentalism and Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, I have a chapter in this book on Al Qaeda and and Bin Laden. And when the book came out, it was one of the first comprehensive chapter or, you know, pieces of writing on him, his life, what he stands for, what his links to the Taliban were. Nobody really knew about, uh, about it before then. Did you ever talk to George Bush about this stuff? No, no, no. Did you, ever talk, to, did you ever talk to Tony Blair about it? Yes, I did. I, did. I met Blair several times. Were there yeah. other American officials that said, come over when, you, when I talk yes, to you? Yes, yes, yes. At what I, level? I did. Well, I mean, people like uh, Wolfowitz and, you know, Rumsfeld and uh, Andrew Natsios at AID and uh, in the State Department. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, I think, you know, initially in the Bush administration, were very interested. I became very frustrated by the Bush administration later on because uh, very quickly, you know, I, I mean, I realized that they were going to go into Iraq. And, you know, everybody then started saying, well, once they, go, once they start preparing for Iraq, uh, you know, the, 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 the eyes are off Afghanistan completely. And that's what happened. And, and then, I mean, you know, I still used to come to Washington to lecture or to attend conferences and things like that. And one used to see officials. And, and they would call you in pro forma, but they, wouldn't, they weren't really listening because their, their whole, f I mean, they weren't going to um, uh, carry out any of your suggestions because you knew that the whole focus, the funding, the resources, the troops, the money, everything was for Iraq. The best analysis that I've been able to read is that we have spent as a country a trillion dollars so far, 300 billion of that in yeah. Afghanistan. Have we, got our, have we gotten our yeah. money's worth? Yeah. Sorry, a billion and a half in Afghanistan. No, no, three hundred billion. Right. Wait. No, not at all. Because you know, it's it's it's. I think if if there had been a concentration on Afghanistan, I mean, I remember two or three of uh, sort of experts, or friends of mine here in the states. I mean, we, we on the back of an envelope, we worked out that what the U.S. needs to do is to give about five billion a year for five years for the development of the country, and about five billion to for building up the security forces of the country. We came to 10 billion, which if you shared with Europe was chicken feed. Now, if that had happened in the first five years, um, you know, Afghanistan wouldn't be in the mess it is today. The Taliban would not have been able to come back and stage their uh, resurgence in, in 2003, 2004. Um, what happened was that even that paltry sum was not spent. And, and if, you know, if money did go, it was not spent properly because there was just a lack of focus, lack of attention, lack of expertise. I mean, the kinds of things you see now General McChrystal doing in Afghanistan, you know, where these military officers are learning the languages and they know all the tribes and then they're investigating tribal history and who's who and what's what. Nobody did this for years and years. So there was just so much wastage. Uh, unfortunately, wastage in lives, wastage of resources and money, American resources and money. Um, and it's really only the last two or three years that I think, you know, your country has got serious about trying to do something about Afghanistan. Let's just, uh, for hypothetical, uh, go ahead to 2013 or 14 or 15. I don't care what year it is. Based on what you know now, when we're going to pull out and all that stuff, what will be the situation over there in your opinion? Well, I think, again, I'm on a sort of mission, basically, which is to say, I mean, it's very clear the Americans want to withdraw. 
Uh, and certainly before your 2012 elections, I'm sure President Obama will want to show the American people that he's moved the bulk of forces out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, if that is the case, we've got very short time left. He's even given a date of July 2011, whereby he wants to start the withdrawal of American forces. Now, the moment you start withdrawing, NATO will run for the exits. So we're talking about a very serious depletion of military, Western military forces in Afghanistan. What's the numbers of total troops, NATO and American, right now? Well, um, it's about uh, 140,000. And is, how many and by the end of it, th by the end of this year, there'll be about 100,000 American troops. And the rest will be NATO. Uh, and, and the rest will be how NATO. How many countries are left participating? In oh, that? there are. There are there's about uh, uh, 47 countries. And so, there have been some But many of these countries have like 10 troops yeah. there, you know. And then some have announced they're getting out. Some of them have already announced. The Canadians have said we're leaving in 2011, come what may. Whatever, you know, the, the Americans, whatever. Uh, the Dutch are probably going to leave um, also. Uh, there's a huge controversy in Germany going on right now. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel may be forced to announce some kind of withdrawal. Um, and so what, I mean, the point is, uh, and uh, on top of that, General McChrystal and General Petraeus have said very clearly <coughs> that we, can, we, we, America, cannot win this war on the ground. There has to be a political settlement. Now, I think the, the real task for the Obama administration now is um, you have to look at the political settlement. That is a, a settlement between Karzai, President Karzai, and the government and the Taliban. Now, um, what, you know, what, how, how that will shape out depends a lot on the Americans. Um, at the moment, Obama has said that he will not support uh, talks with the Taliban leadership, although Karzai is doing that. Um, what I think is vital now is that the Americans agree to talk to the Taliban leadership. And we really now work in the next 18 months for a serious political settlement, which involves not, of course, just the Taliban and Karzai. It also involves the whole region, because Pakistan is involved in this war. Afghanistan has six neighbors. They are all involved in this war. On, you know, they have proxies, they have um, influence, they have strategic interests in Afghanistan. They all want a piece of the pie. And if there's going to be a settlement, they all want a piece of the pie even more. What do you understand our mission to be there? Why are we there? Well, I think the mission has changed a great deal. Um, if we look at, you know, I mean, initially it was there to take revenge on the attacks on um, New York and Washington. And to um, get rid of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, except the leadership of Taliban and Al-Qaeda all escaped. Um, you didn't commit troops even during the war in 2001, insufficient numbers, which would have trapped Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They escaped to Pakistan and they came back in again. Why? I, th I think the other mission was to rebuild the country, which again didn't happen. Why would we want to rebuild that country? Well, I think there's no doubt that uh, to leave Afghanistan as a failed state in, in the kind of conditions that it was in 2001 would just be an invitation for all these extremists to come back again. Um, uh, uh, and you'd have to repeat the whole performance all over again. Aren't there other countries in the world, though, they could just move to if this country had been restored to some... Uh, semblance of democracy, or did it ever have a democracy in Afghanistan? Well, you know, I mean, Afghanistan has six neighbors. Now, in the 90s, um, what fueled the Taliban uh, appearance in 93 was a civil war. And that civil war was fueled by all the neighbors. Pakistan was backing the Taliban. India, Iran, Central Asia, the five republics in Cent Central Asia were all backing what was then called the Northern Alliance. You're talking about Turkmenistan and Tajikistan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had... You had all the neighbors interfering, pumping, pumping, you know, the warlords with money, with weapons, with, you know, to carry on fighting because they wanted, you know, influence and interests in Afghanistan. Why, though? Why do they want to be in Afghanistan? Because Afghanistan is so strategic. You know, Af Afghanistan is a landlocked country. It's surrounded by six countries. Um, uh, now, uh, all the ethnic groups of Afghanistan spill over into the neighboring countries. So that's the first reason. For example, the Pashtuns of Afghanistan they spill over into Pakistan. The Baloch in Afghanistan spill over into Iran, etc. The Tajiks, the Uzbeks, all these ethnic groups, they spill over into Central Asia. So everybody has you know, um, strategic interests, ethnic interests, political interests. Um, Afghanistan could also be a corridor for oil and gas from Central Asia to the Gulf if there was ever going to be peace there. 
Now, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we need a political settlement that is not just in, within Afghanistan, but also includes the region. And these same countries that fueled the war in the 90s cannot be allowed to do that again because it would be devastating, because that would uh, create another civil war in Afghanistan, which would invite back probably al-Qaeda. I, I got a profile here on Afghanistan. I just read some of this and tell me uh, what's right and what's wrong. 99% are Muslim, yeah. Afghanistan. 80% Sunni, 90%, I mean 19% Shia. You're right. Two-thirds live on fewer than $2 a day. Yeah. 3.3 Afghans, 3.3 uh, million Afghans are are involved in producing opium. Yeah. Out of 28 million. Yeah. One third of the gross domestic product is drugs. Right. Television under the Taliban was wiped out in 1996. There were no yeah. television. All media. All media. Yeah. Literacy 34 percent. Probably lower than that. But yeah. Highest infant mortality rate in the world: 257 right. deaths per 1,000 births. Right. Uh, some of these things have improved, let me tell you. I mean, today, you know, under the Taliban, there were about 100,000 students in school. Today, there are 7 million. So probably the literacy rate has probably gone up. Um, uh, health has improved enormously. There's been a lot of investment in health by the Europeans, by the Americans, etc. Health rates, uh, and especially health related to women, has probably improved. Um, so some of these figures, you know, but the economy, is, is, is way down. The drugs thing, you're absolutely right. Um, it, is, it is a huge proportion of the, of the GDP. Um, uh, so there, there, has been, there has been some very good things on the social side, you know, health, education. But it's been, been, there's been very late building of the economic infrastructure, of, of an indigenous economy, which would provide jobs, which would actually lift people's living standards. In the back of your book, you have some appendix. Appendices. Appendix mm -hmm. one, a sample of Taliban decrees relating to women and other cultural issues after mm -hmm. the capture of Ka Kabul in 1996. I just want to read some of this. Mm -hmm. I want you to explain it. Uh, first of all, Taliban are Muslims. Mm -hmm. How, and is it all based on religion, by the way? Is it? No, it's not. Because, I mean, what I write in this book, even at that time I wrote, was that the Taliban were a mixture of, of two or three things. Um, a, a very orthodox uh, sect of Sunni Islam, which was very conservative and very reactionary, even within the mainframe of Islam, a, a code of, of the Pashtun tribes to which they belonged. And this code, they because they came from very backward areas of Afghanistan, they adhered to. And thirdly was the influence of madrasa education, religious school education in Pakistan, which um, taught them uh, a great deal about extremism and this, this whole extremist philosophy. By what, what does it mean to be a Pashtun? And how, how much of Afghanistan are Pashtun? Well, you know, the, the, the Pashtuns are the largest. They're not the majority. They're about 40%. They're the largest ethnic group in the country. Traditionally, they have ruled Afghanistan for the last 250 years. Um, Pashtun kings have been always been kings of Afghanistan. Um, and, and until the Soviets arrived, basically, they uh, predominantly subjugated the minorities who were the Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, all sorts of, you know, um, uh, a dozen mi mi minority ethnic groups. So the ethnic question in Afghanistan has always been terribly important. The Karzai is a Pashtun. He came to the, so the ruling elite today is a Pashtun. The Taliban are also Pashtun. So the main, so, so in, in many ways, this is a battle between two tribal groups of Pashtuns. The Pashtuns are a tribal society. They live under a tribal code and under a tribal hierarchy. And um, it, 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 one of the tests, you know, has been how to move this tribal hierarchy into a modern state structure. Because the old kings of Afghanistan um, ruled by basically buying off the tribes. You know, doing favors to one tribe, buying another tribe, bribing another one, whatever. Um, and, and obviously you can't you can't do this in a modern state structure if you want education and economy and all the rest of it. So this has been one of the challenges. Let me just read some of the decrees. Yeah. If women are going to um, outside with fa going outside with fashionable or ornamental tight and charming clothes to show themselves, they will be cursed by the Islamic Sharia and should never expect to go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, What's, this what? was this was the Taliban in the 90s when they were ruling the country. Uh, Do they still expect this of women? Well, 
There have been suggestions that not. But first of all, let me tell you that during this war, they have burnt down um, hundreds of girls' schools and boys' schools. Now, um, uh, and they say that these schools are used by the, by the Americans and by the CIA, etc. Um, now, clearly, this is going to be one of the most contentious issues in, in any dialogue with the Taliban, the treatment of women, because there's been huge advances in Afghanistan right, you know, over the last seven years. Education, women are working, you know, and women are very wary, naturally, of, of what talking to the Taliban means. Does it mean that our rights disappear again? We go behind the burqa and we, you know, we, we go back to the 90s again. Um, this is going to be one of the most uh, difficult and sensitive areas. Here's one. To prevent music to be broadcasted by the public information resources in shops, hotels, vehicles, and rickshaws, cassettes, and music are prohibited. This matter should be monitored within five days. If any music cassette found in a shop, the shopkeeper should be imprisoned and the shop locked. If five people guarantee the shop should be opened and the criminal released later. If cassette found in the vehicle, the vehicle and the driver will be imprisoned. If five people guarantee the vehicle will be released and the criminal released later. What's that about? <laughs> well, they shut down all the media. They shut down music. You know, and what is, of course, very ironic is that today the Taliban are media specialists. The way they use the Internet, the, um, you know, they get out news faster than the Americans and NATO does. You know, when there's an ambush or, or an attack, uh, they claim responsibility literally within minutes. You know, and, and, you know, American headquarters in Kabul have not even put out a statement. They haven't even acknowledged that these soldiers have died. So what has happened is that the Taliban, I think, of, you know, they, they suppress the media terribly, print, radio, TV, everything. And music, of course. They banned music at that time. Now we see the Taliban using the media more effectively, actually, than the government. Some of this other stuff, just to put it on the table, to prevent keeping pigeons and playing with birds. Yeah to prevent kite flying, the kite shops in the city should be abolished, yeah. to prevent the British and American hairstyle, people with long hair should be arrested and taken to the religious police department to shave their hair. The criminal has to pay the barber. Um, what, what is this business about religious police, the Muntkrat? The, the religious police was uh, something they adopted from Saudi Arabia. Um, in Saudi, there is religious police who go around the bazaar so that everybody goes to prayers at the right time, the shops are closed and all this. Um, they, they've been much reduced in Saudi, but the Taliban religious police were brutal. They, uh, five times a day, you know, Muslims say their prayers, and they would close down the bazaar uh, five times a day. And, you know, this had never happened before in Afghanistan or in any other, in any other South Asian Muslim country. Uh, I mean, you know, if you wanted to say your prayers, you went. You weren't forced to say your prayers. The Taliban insisted that everybody went to say their prayers. And, um, um, and they used the religious police who were basically young kids, um, you know, who had no uh, education, no training. Uh, they would carry long sticks and some of them would carry guns um, and they would enforce this. The British and American haircut is very amusing. Um, if you remember at that time, this film, The Titanic, came out. And Leonard Di DiCaprio had this haircut, which was uh, followed. Uh, I meant there was a huge, you know, they had banned TV and video. But um, video, pirated video films were all the rage in Kabul at that time. And even the Taliban used to watch it, even though, you know, it was banned. Um, and the Titanic was the best, you know, biggest seller ever because of the love story or whatever. And his haircut was the favorite haircut of the young people in Kabul. And the Taliban realized that this was a sign of dissent and sort of, you know, a bit like Iran, what's happening now when women sort of slightly take off their job, you know. And um, so the Taliban had to ban, it was called the Titanic haircut. And the Taliban were thinking that this is a sign of revolt, you know, and we have to ban it. It's a requirement, if I understand it correctly, the Constitution of Afghanistan today, that 25% of the members of the parliament have to be women. Right. Where did that come from? Well, I think it came um, uh, largely from the West, but it also was a uh, you know, very strong demand amongst women activists, you know, uh, Afghan women. Who, you know, Afghan women who had, uh, had struggled through the Taliban era, who, had, who, school, who were not allowed to school, who were not allowed to be educated, who, uh, who had been working before, even during the Civil War, um, but were then banned by the Taliban. Um, the reason I asked, though, I wondered if that was a demand on the part of the American 
government that they have 25 percent. I think it was a demand. It was certainly, you know, uh, it was not a direct demand like that, I think. You know, I think what the Americans said was that we would like to see more women in parliament and please find a way to do it. But they did the same thing in Iraq where they have a 25 percent commitment. I, I guess they asked yeah. if there's no uh, well, American federal legislature here that has 25 percent women uh, in it. Of course, of course. Um, but, you know, both in Iraq and, uh, well, particularly in Afghanistan, the United Nations helped um, form the Constitution. And I think the UN took in a lot of the uh, 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 demands, requests made by European powers. Um, I think this was probably a request coming in more from some of the Europeans, the Scandinavians, for example, and, uh, and countries like that. But as I said, there was also a very strong woman's revival in Afghanistan after the defeat of the Taliban. And, and they were insisting on a, on a proper share. Um, uh, you know, I, and uh, they certainly have got uh, more than any other Muslim country, probably uh, than any other Western country also. Now, this is, sounds like it's off the wall, and I'm going to change subjects completely. I'm going to ask you about a guy named A.Q. Khan. Do you no. know him? No, no, I don't know him personally. I met him, but I don't know him personally. Do no. you know where he is today? Yeah, he's in Pakistan. He's... Uh, He's living at home. He's uh, very much under guard, and uh, he's free to move around, but he's kind of kept under uh, control, as it were. Tell me, if, in 25 words or less, what did he do? What, what? Well, he was one of Pakistan's uh, leading nuclear scientists who uh, um, proliferated uh, nuclear technology to, to various countries. Iran, North Korea, yeah. places like that. And, and, but the whole argument is whether he did this on his own or with a team of people, or whether he did it with permission of the military and the state structure of Pakistan, because the nuclear program in Pakistan is not run by A.Q. Khan, it's run by the army. And um, uh, the whole question, which has never been answered adequately, is, is whether um, when A.Q. Khan was doing all this proliferation, um, uh, whether he was doing it on behalf of the state, on, on behalf of the military. And I assume the U.S. didn't like it when they found this out. Yeah, v uh, you know, very much so. And, I, and of course, they put enormous pressure on Musharraf. And then he was exposed when uh, the CIA caught this uh, uh, shipload of uh, nuclear parts that was going to Libya. Uh, and he'd done a deal with Colonel Gaddafi to build a, uh, a nuclear weapon in Libya. And uh, these parts were caught by the Americans and the British. And then it became, uh, you know, you, uh, M General Musharraf, who was then president of Pakistan, was forced to um, arrest A.Q. Khan. The reason, he, he's, he's writing for a living. Uh, I mean, he's, I found a, the, the day right. we we're recording this, he had a column in the uh, News International. Right. But right. I want to read you what he said, just to put this in perspective. <laughs> Talking about Pakistan, he says, we realize that this poor country has not only been looted a hundred times, it has been robbed continuously for the past 60 years, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Democratic governments prove to be no different from military dictators. The good times lasted only for the five years of our independence. Leaders at that time were so honest that when, I don't know these names, I'm sure you do, Malana Madudi yeah. uh, taunted Liaquat Ali Khan about his new suit. The prime minister showed the receipt in the, in the next gathering, pointing out that he still had to pay the tailor. He jumps down a little bit more. What a contrast now. Our rulers and leaders own luxurious villas, extremely expensive cars, foreign properties, and foreign currency accounts. Their luxurious way of living would put uh, many Nawabs and Rajas to shame. Their motorcades being city traffic to halt, uh, causing untold miseries to the public. The emperors and the kings in our history were kind and caring and conscious of the needs and comfort of the people. I can go on with this, mm. but he's point, painting a picture of Pakistan mm. of being that it doesn't matter whether it's military dictators or whether it's a, a dem democracy. What do you say about this? Because we're seeing this in our own country now. Well, I mean, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very popular, I mean, he's kind of, you know, reflecting a very popular view. But at the same time, you know, he's become very much an Islamist. And uh, uh, reflects, he's become a very deeply conservative, holds extremely reactionary views um, on almost everything. And um, uh, essentially, I mean, you know, what his argument will boil down to, that we are not following the precepts uh, um, of Islam. So I think what is, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, this is, this, is, this is populist. I mean, you know, a lot of young Pakistanis believe this, and it's true. 
um, our ruling elite have, have failed us in many, many ways. Um, politically, of course, they failed us because we still don't have a stable political system. We interact between military rule and corrupt and incompetent civilian rule. Um, uh, and, and the political elite, which includes the military, uh, and both civilian and military, um, you know, have failed to unite the nation, have failed to develop the nation. Um, uh, uh, our, our economic indicators are also terrible, um, not as bad as Afghanistan, but, but pretty bad. Um, and, and countries like, um, uh, we, we, you know, we make enemies around our, ourselves. We don't take responsibility for anything. For example, the extremism now in Pakistan, we pretend this is all a creation of, you know, the, um, the Americans or because the Americans f told us to fight the jihad against the Soviets in the 80s. This is all a fault of the Americans or it's a fault of um, conspiracies by India or Israel. Um, I think the biggest thing we need to do is to take responsibilities for our own actions. and We don't do that. What do the uh, Pakistanis that you know behind the scenes say about America and all the money we've sent to Pakistan? Well, there's a very ambivalent attitude. There's a lot of anti-Americanism in Pakistan, even amongst the ruling elite who benefited most from American largesse, whether it's the military elite because they've got arms and weapons and all the rest of it, or whether it's the civilian elite. Um, now, you know, uh, I think a lot of this uh, uh, um, uh, anti-Americanism, uh, unfortunately, is, is being fueled as an excuse by the elite not to recognize the fact that, you know, the mistakes that have been made in Pakistan have been made by us primarily. Um, yes, the Americans have had some very wrong policies, you know, going into Iraq, failing to resolve the Middle East and the Palestinian-Israeli problem. Um, you know, I mean, American foreign policy is full of holes and lacuna and, and things that should have not happened. But um, uh, at the same time, I mean, I think we have to recognize what we are responsible for, for ourselves. Let me go back to what I asked you earlier, four or five years from now, what, what is it going to look like, in, in your opinion, in Afghanistan, or for that matter, uh, w with al-Qaeda or with the uh, Taliban? Well, I hope that in the next uh, um, uh, 12 months uh, to 18 months, before a serious American withdrawal starts from Afghanistan, that there is a political settlement that is endorsed by the West and by the U.S. That is, and is backed up by its continuing money for aid and development. Um, that there is a kind of ceasefire that holds, and that there is a regional agreement amongst the neighboring countries that holds. Now, all this is a very big uh, and complex game. You have to do an internal settlement. You have to do an external settlement. You have to guarantee the continuation of building up the Afghan state. Um, but al-Qaeda is going to be left after all. Al-Qaeda is going to be left. But, you know, I mean, I, I, everybody acknowledges the, the sort of the, 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 the heart of al-Qaeda are perhaps a few hundred people, mostly in Pakistan. And, and you don't need armies to go after these people. You need good intelligence. You need um, economic development so that people are won over to your side rather than, you know, won over to the al-Qaeda side. Um, uh, you need special forces. You need you need a war of in, of intelligence rather than a war of of you know hundreds of thousands of troops. So we're going to be spending a lot more money in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Well, not just you. I hope that there will be a lot of burden sharing, you know, uh, with uh, b uh, Western Europe, with Japan, with countries who are contributing now to Afghanistan in a meaningful way. Will continue to do so. On the day we're recording this, April the fifteenth. When you were here in the town in, in Washington, there was a front page story on the in the Washington Post, and the headline was "U.S. Retreat from Afghan Valley Marks Recognition of Blunder," and it's the is it pronounced the valley? It's uh, Karengal. That's the, yeah. that the way you pronounce it, Karengal Valley. And it, it they talked to a, a you know, they written by Greg Jaffe, a Washington Post reporter, Captain Mark Moretti. He's 28 years old, commander, and um, this is in a valley where 40 U.S. troops have been killed, yeah. and they're pulling out. But here's, here's what it says in the middle of the article. For U.S. commanders, the Karengal Valley offers a hard lesson in the limits of American power and goodwill in Afghanistan. The valley's extreme isolation, its axle-breaking terrain, and its inhabitants' uh, suspicion of outsiders make it a perfect spot to wage an insurgency against the Western Army. It goes on, we've been there since 2005, and the troops there were in essence, as this article says by Greg Jaffe, bullet magnets. The withdrawal could offer proof to other Afghans that U.S. troops can be forced out. There are pictures in there of Mr. of Captain Moretti uh, that the Washington Post took and we show them on the screen. 
uh, again, you read this and you go, is all this worth it? Look at, you can see that our, our, this, our captain sitting there holding hands, explain that, with the local tribal leader. How do we, how do, we do this? How do we keep doing this? And um, what's the good of all this? First, let me just say that the Kurangal Valley is a, is a particular area with a very long history um, of opposition to all outsiders. And it's, it's very rugged. It was, a, it was an area that the Soviets never occupied because it was too impossible to occupy in, 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 in the 80s. Um, perhaps you should never have gone there. The first American troops went there about four years ago because President Karzai insisted on it. It was not part of the American military um, sort of doctrine to occupy every nook and cranny in Afghanistan. You, are, you occupied areas where you could woo, woo the population, win the population, where you could do some good works, and where you could resist the Taliban. Um, and this was a bit of, this was really off the beaten track. And there was a history there. This was the center of the Mujahideen resistance to the Soviets, you know. And of course, it had, it had become a Taliban center also. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, first of all, this is a bit of a rarity. But I think, you know, what, the, what, what in broadly speaking, what this shows is that for too many years, um, the military, the civilians, the American civilians in Afghanistan, they pursued wrong policies. Um, you know, I think now, finally, the new counterterrorism doctrine uh, by Petraeus and, and, and McChrystal, which is focusing on population centers, on clearing out the Taliban and then bringing in aid and development, etc. This, if this had happened right from the beginning, I, again, I say I don't think we would have had the Taliban resurgence in 2003. The fact was that America refused to deploy troops in 2002, 2003 and 4. And what happened was that the, there was a vacuum. And it was filled first by the warlords who were rapacious and and, and horrible against, their, against the local population. And um, this vacuum was then filled by the Taliban. And if you had filled important uh, areas where populations were concentrated um, earlier on and, and had an economic plan to minimally develop the country, I'm not saying turn it into a Switzerland, but just give them a basic kind of you know, economy, which the Afghans had in the 70s and the 60s, um, uh, you know, I think we, the whole story would have been different. So, uh, when you're talking to Americans and there's no camera there and you're not reporting, what do they tell you about, do they, do most Americans you come in contact with care about Afghanistan and our role there? Well, I think certainly it's now the number one foreign policy agenda for, for this administration. But do they uh, care? Yes, I do, because I think they, I, I, I think people in government care because they still see it as a potential threat, the fact that Al-Qaeda is still out there. Um, but I think now in this administration for the first time, perhaps you've got people who really do care about Afghanistan. They've served there. They've, they've, they've learned about Afghanistan. Um, if you're looking at the military, if you're looking at people in the State Department, you're looking at uh, um, uh, NGOs and, and aid workers, you know, uh, people who go there, uh, I mean, like me, you know, I mean, why have I stuck with Afghanistan for so long? Because this is, it's not just a fascinating country. The people just draw you in. The country sucks you in. You, you know, if you go in, um, uh, you know, for, for the first time, you will be forever involved and interested in Afghanistan. It, it, it has a very magnetic appeal. What? Give uh, us an example. I don't know. I mean, you know, the Afghan are very special kind of people. I, I think one of the first things is that, you know, this, this was a people who were never colonized. And, and um, the, the, uh, the Afghans were the only Asian people who were never colonized by the British or the French or by anyone else or the Americans or by anyone else. So they've retained a kind of um, grandeur and sort of independence and um, but enormous warmth and hospitality and um, uh, friendship. The country is an amazing looking country. It's got everything, you know, desert, mountain, the, 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 the highest mountains in the world, the lowest deserts, um, you know. Uh, it, 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 I mean, the landscape, the people, it's all very odd. You know what, what I mean, the, the, the many Afghans joke that when, um, you know, uh, four-fifths of, of Afghanistan is uninhabitable because it's, you know, it's either too high, the mountains, or the, you know, the, the, the deserts are too, 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 too large. And, and uh, the Afghans joke that when God made the world in seven days, he made the rest of the world in six days. And then somebody said, oh, you know, there's a hole, there's a, 
there's a gap in the middle there, you know. So he, he collected all the bits and pieces that were left over, you know, the spare parts that had been left over from making all the other countries. And he threw them all down and said, this is Afghanistan. So that's why Afghanistan has a bit of everything, you know. It has areas which look like Switzerland, and it has areas that look like the Sahara Desert. And it, its people reflect the same. You've got, you've got people who are completely white with blue eyes, who are supposed to be the descendants of Alexander the Great. You've got Mongols from, from Mongolia and China. You've got people from Central Asia. You've got people from South Asia. Um, you know, and, and you can see it in their faces. I mean, you know, it's got languages from all over the world. I mean, literally, it's got dozens of languages. So this is a, it's a very special place. So what are the chances that uh, Pakistan will ever get uh, back to normality? Well, I hope that we will, um, you know, as long as democracy continues, as long as the military does not intervene again. Uh, we've got a very bad democracy, a poor democracy. If this democracy was given time, it, there was another election without military interference, um, a new kind of new generation of leaders come in uh, and get attracted, come into politics, come into public service, you know, um, I think, you know, things will, will slowly change. The problem is that, you know, our whole democratic experiment has been interrupted by the military every 10 years. And so we go back, you know, we reinvent the wheel every 10 years. And it's, it's, it's a terrible situation to be in. So do you have another book? I know you just put one out in 2008. Well, uh, Descent into Chaos um, covers most of this post 9-11 period in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. Uh, and, and brings you up to 2009. No, at the moment I'm not working on any other book. I think things are too much in flux at the moment. Um, perhaps, you know, I might like to write a novel, uh, move away from some of this uh, factual stuff. Ahmed Rashid has been our guest and we've been talking about his book Taliban, which is available uh, in paperback and has been for the last 10 years. And uh, we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next, the third debate between